Light felonies are those infractions of the law for the commission of which the penalty of arrest menor or a fine that exceeding 40,000 pesos or both fine and imprisonment may be imposed by the court. Under Article 7, light felonies as a rule are punished only in the consummated stage, except in case of crimes against persons and crimes against property, they can be punished not only in the consummated stage. Under Article 8, we have the so-called conspiracy to commit a felony and also <clears throat> proposal to commit a felony. A conspiracy exists when two or more persons come to an agreement concerning the commission of a felony and they decide to commit it. There is proposal to commit a felony when a person who has decided to commit a felony proposes its execution to another person. So in case of conspiracy, there must be at least two persons who had come to an agreement to commit the crime. In case of proposal, only one person has decided to commit the crime and he gave the proposal to another person. If that other person on whom the proposal is given agrees, it is no longer merely proposal, it is already a conspiracy to commit a felony. As a rule, conspiracy and proposal to commit a felony are not punishable acts because they are mere preparatory acts. And the law requires at least an overt act to amount to the attempted stage in the, committee, in the commission of a felony. So as a rule, conspiracy to commit a felony and also proposal to commit a felony are not punishable acts but merely preparatory acts. Exception to the rule, as provided for under Article 8, Conspiracy and proposal to commit a felony shall be punishable only when the law especially provides a penalty, therefore. So when the law particularly provides a penalty for the mere act of conspiring, for the mere act of proposing to commit a felony, they become crimes by themselves. So based on this, we have two concepts of conspiracy. One is conspiracy as a crime by itself, and the other one is Conspiracy as a means of committing a felony. Conspiracy is a crime by itself when the law particularly, especially provides a penalty for the mere act of conspiring. A, B, C, D, and E met, planned, and agreed to come out, uprise with other people, and to overthrow the government. What crime is committed? The crime committed is conspiracy to commit rebellion. This is an example of a conspiracy as a crime by itself because conspiracy to commit rebellion is punished under Article 136 of Book 2. It is a crime by itself. The mere act of conspiring is already a punishable act. There need not be an overt act of rebellion. A, B, C, D, and E met, planned, and agreed to kidnap the son of a rich family to extort ransom. Can they be held liable for conspiracy to commit kidnapping for ransom? They cannot. It is not a punishable act. There is no provision in Book 2 which punishes conspiracy to commit kidnapping for ransom. It is not a punishable act. There must be an overt act in order to bring about the crime of kidnapping for ransom. So here, Conspiracy is only a means of committing a crime. If conspiracy is a means of committing a crime, we have two kinds. We have direct or express conspiracy, and the other one is implied or inferred conspiracy. There is direct or express conspiracy when the conspirators met, planned, and agreed to commit a crime. It is a conspiracy based on preconceived plan. Since it is a conspiracy based, on a preconceived plan, the mere presence of one during the time of the commission of the crime makes him already a conspirator. He did not perform an active participation in the commission of the crime. Reason is, he was part of the planning. He was part of the agreement. That is direct or express conspiracy. The other kind of conspiracy is implied or inferred conspiracy. Implied or inferred conspiracy is a conspiracy which is deduced from the mode and manner of committing the crime. Here, 
the offender acted together in a simultaneous and synchronized manner towards a common criminal objective, towards a common criminal design. Implied or inferred conspiracy is a conspiracy which has no preconceived plan. The conspirators did not, did not meet. The conspirators did not plan the commission of the crime. The conspiracy was established at the spur of the moment, impulsively, based on the turn of events, based on the acts performed by each one of them. In case of implied conspiracy, since this is a conspiracy which is based on the acts performed by the offender, mere presence, mere acquiescence to the commission of the crime will not make one a conspirator. There must be, there need to be an active participation in the commission of the crime before one may be considered conspira a conspirator based on implied conspiracy. Whether it is direct or expressed conspiracy, or implied or inferred conspiracy, the moment conspiracy is proven, the act of one is the act of one. The moment conspiracy is established, the act of one is the act of one. This means that the moment conspiracy is established, all perpetrators are punished to the same extent. The same penalty shall be imposed on them regardless of the quantity and quality of their participation in the commission of the crime. The moment conspiracy is established, you do not ask who inflicted the fatal blow, who performed a minor act, who performed a major act. That is immaterial because since conspiracy is established, all of them will be imposed with the same penalty prescribed by law. While X was walking, A appeared in front of X. And uh, A told X, I heard that you have been saying bad things against me in the cooperative. Why are you doing that? However, before X was able to, get, to give a reply, A immediately backs him, kick him, and Thereafter, he continuously backs and kicked him until X was pinned down on the ground. While X was pinned down on the ground, A went on top of the body of X, pulled out a fan knife, opened it, and he was about to stab the neck of X to kill X. But however, instead, he stopped the ground. Thereafter, he left. The moment A left, X was about to stand up. But before he managed to stand up, here comes B and C, brothers of A. B and C immediately arrived, and both of them stabbed X to death. A, B, and C were all arrested, and they were charged as conspirators for the crime of murder. Is there conspiracy among A, B, and C? The conspiracy would lie only in so far as B and C are concerned. There is no conspiracy in so far as A is concerned. It is evident based on the facts that there is on the part of A no intent to kill X. He placed himself on, on the top of the body of the defeated X. He opened the knife, but instead of stabbing X, he stopped the ground and left. That shows lack of intent to kill. Therefore, he cannot be said to be a conspirator of his brothers B and C, who immediately arrived and stopped the victim to death. Conspiracy would lie only in so far as B and C are concerned. Friends A, B, and C, all armed with long firearms, knocked at the door of the house of X. The moment X opened the door, A immediately fired shots at the owner. Thereafter, B and C both closed the door and they all left. They were later arrested and they were charged as conspirators for the crime of murder. But B and C both contended they are not liable. B and C said they are not liable because they did not fire even a single shot. It was only A who fired at X, the owner of the house. The participation of B and C would only be that of closing the door and then thereafter, all of them left. So according to them, they are not liable as conspirators 
in the crime of murder. Will their defense lie in their favor? Their argument would not lie in their favor. Conspiracy is present among A, B, and C. In the case of People versus Gorgi Torena, the Supreme Court said, there need not be direct evidence for one to be held liable as a conspirator. There is conspiracy, or conspiracy can be established from the acts of the offender done before, during, or immediately after the commission of the crime. Based on this, prior to the commission of the crime, A, B, and C arrived in the house of X with long firearms. During the commission of the crime, A parted the victim, B, and C closed the door. After the commission of the crime, all of them left at the same time. These acts done by A, B, and C showed, revealed, there was a direct or express conspiracy among them. They planned the said act of killing. Therefore, regardless of the fact that B and C only participated in a minor way, all of them will be liable as conspirators for the crime of murder. X was trying to stop Y. However, Y evaded the blow. Then, here comes W. W saw that X could not stop Y. W went at the back of Y. And he held both hands of Y at the back. And thereafter, X stopped Y. Here comes Z. Z saw everything and Z cheered and said, Go on, stop him more. And X stopped and stopped Y. Are there, is there conspiracy among X? Among, is there conspiracy, yes, among X, among W, and among Z? There is conspiracy, implied conspiracy among X and W, but Z, in so far as Z is concerned, he is not part of the implied conspiracy. X was the one who stopped the victim. X could not have stopped the victim had not W held the arms or the hands of the victim at the back, making him in a in, making him in a in a steady position. Therefore, the acts done by W are direct acts necessary in order to consummate the crime. Hence, W become a conspirator of X based on the term of events, based on the acts performed by W. There was an impulsive. There was an impulsive conspiracy, an inferred conspiracy established at the spark of the moon. How about Z? Z is not a conspirator. The mere act of Z killing go on, stop him more. That will not suffice to make him a conspirator unless and until he perform an active participation in the commission of the crime. Again, in case of implied conspiracy, before one can be held as a, as a conspirator, there must be an active participation in the commission of the crime. But not in so far as direct or express conspiracy is concerned. X is, um, X is a government official and uh, he, he was the head of this department and he connived and conspired with A, B, C, D, E, and F. And together, they were able to amass ill-gotten wealth in the amount of 800 million pesos. And so, they were all charged for the crime of plunder. What kind of conspiracy is present among X? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. There are two kinds of multiple conspiracy. We have the so-called will or circle conspiracy, and the other one is the so-called chain conspiracy. There is will or circle conspiracy when a person or a group of person known as the hub deals individually with another person or group of person known as the spokes. In this case, what is present is will conspiracy. X is the hub, and he deals individually with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H as the spokes. And the conspiracy is to amass ill-gotten wealth, and it amounted to 800 million pesos. Hence, they're liable for plunder, and what is present is will or circle conspiracy. 
In the case of GMA, the Supreme Court said that in order to establish this will conspiracy in the crime of plunder, the prosecution has to identify who is the main plunderer. That's why the former President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo was acquitted. She filed a um, demurrer to evidence. It was denied by the Sandigan Bayan, but the Supreme Court upheld the demurrer to evidence. Supreme Court said, the office of the ombudsman, the prosecutors of the ombudsman, failed to establish who is the main plunderer, who is the hub that deals individually with the spokes. Without the hub, there cannot be conspiracy, and so the former president was acquitted of the crime of plunder. The other kind of multiple conspiracy is known as the chain conspiracy. Chain conspiracy is present in so far as narcotics or other contrabands are concerned. It revolves upon the constant and continuous communication and dealings, just like in ordinary businesses from the manufacturer to the wholesaler, the wholesaler to the retailer, the retailer to the consumer. A and his cohorts manufacture shabu in this laboratory. And then, it will be sold to B and his cohorts, the wholesaler. And then it will be sold to C and his cohorts. C and his cohorts, the retailers, will repack it and will sell it to the consumers. What kind of multiple conspiracy is present among A, B, C, and their cohorts? We have the so-called chain conspiracy. Just like in ordinary kind of business, in this act of doing, of, of doing contrabands like Shabu, there was a constant communication among A, B, C, and their courts. This kind of conspiracy will versus circle, uh, with will or circle conspiracy as well as chain conspiracy has been recently a favorite question in the bar from bar 2015, 2016, and 2017, even last year. For three consecutive bar exams, this has always been asked. And the source of this is the case of Fernand and Torrevillas versus people. You can also cite GMA versus, versus people. These are the two cases wherein this kind of conspiracy had been discussed by the Supreme Court. In, can there be conspiracy in violation of special penal laws? The, um, the wife filed a case of violation of RA 9262 against the husband. And the wife included in the case her parents-in-law, that is, the parents of the, of the said husband. The charges for violation of RA 9262 because of failure to give support. According to the wife, this <coughs> husband doesn't want to give support to their children, and it was because of the said parents-in-law. Can their conspiracy among the husband and the parents-in-law in case of violation of RA 9262? The Supreme Court said yes in the case of Gotham versus Khan. Supreme Court said there can exist conspiracy among the husband and the parents-in-law in failure to give support to the said child because there is nothing in RA 9262 which provides that the provisions of the RPC cannot apply to you. Since there is nothing in RA 9262 which provides that the RPC cannot apply to it, therefore, the conspiracy provision in the RPC can apply in case of violations of RA 9262, Violence Against Women and Their Children. Under Article 9, how are felonies classified according to severity? If the question is how are felonies classified according to severity, Felonies are classified according to severity into grave felonies, less grave felonies, and light felonies. Grave felonies are those punished by penalties which in any of their periods are afflictive penalties or capital punishment. Less grave, pen uh, less grave felonies are those which are punished by penalties which in their maximum period are correctional. And lastly, light Felonies are those punished by arrest to menor or a fine not exceeding 40,000 pesos or both fine and imprisonment at the discretion of the court. So those are the felonies according to severity. We have grave, less grave, and light. 
Under Article 10, this is what I'm saying. Under Article 10, the law provides that the provisions of the RPC applies supplementarily, supplementarily to violations of special penal law, except when the special penal law provides otherwise. Example of that, RA 9165, the Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Act. Under Section 98 of RA 9165, the said law expressly provides that the provisions of the RPC shall not apply to violations of RA 9165. And the Supreme Court said, since Section 98 used the word shall, therefore it is mandatory that the provisions of the RPC cannot apply to violations of RA 9165 except as provided in Section 98 in cases of minor offenders. So it is an example of a law wherein the RPC cannot apply supplementarily or supplementarily because it is expressly provided so. We go to the different circumstances that affect the criminal liability of an offender. We have first justifying circumstances. Justifying circumstances are those circumstances which, if present or attendant, in the commission of a felony, the offender is said to have acted within the bounds of the law. The offender is said not to have transgressed the law. Hence, there is no crime committed, there is no criminal, there is no criminal liability, and as a rule, there is no civil liability. So the moment a person, the moment the accused was charged of a crime, and it was proven that he is that he did not violate any law because of the presence of any of the justifying circumstances under Article 11, his act is justified, there is no crime committed. He is not considered a criminal. There is no criminal liability, and as a rule, he incurs also no civil liability because his act is within the bounds of the law. If a person, if an accused, invokes any of the justifying circumstances under Article 11, that accused is in effect admitting the commission of the crime but evading criminal responsibility, therefore. Hence, the moment an accused invokes any of the justifying circumstances under Article 11, it is both an admission and avoidance. He admits the commission of the crime, but he avoids criminal responsibility by saying that his act is justified. In this case, trial will be inverted. In the ordinary course of trial, it is the prosecution or the state that has to present first the evidence because it is the state that has the burden of proving the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt. But the moment the accused invokes any of the justifying circumstances under Article 11, trial will be inverted. Since in admitting it, since in invoking it, he already admitted the commission of the crime, the burden of evidence is shifted on him to prove the elements of the justifying circumstance that he is invoking. If he failed to prove the elements of the justifying circumstance that he is invoking, it will definitely be a conviction. Reason is, he already admitted to the commission of the crime. So the burden is on him, hence trial is inverted. He is the, he is the first to present the evidence to prove the elements of the justifying circumstance that he is invoking. Under Article 11, the following persons do not incur any criminal liability. First, Anyone who acts in defense of his personal rights, provided the following elements are present, or provided the following circumstances concur. First, unlawful aggression. Second, reasonable necessity on the part of the reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent the unlawful aggression. And third, lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself. This is otherwise known as self-defense. Self-defense includes defense of one's life and limb, defense of one's honor and chastity, defense of one's property if coupled by an attack on the person entrusted with the said property. That is, self-defense. The first element is unlawful aggression. 
There are three elements of unlawful aggression. First, there must be a physical or material attack or assault. Second, this physical or material attack or assault must be actual or at least imminent. And third, it must be unlawful. The attack or assault must be unlawful. These are the elements of unlawful aggression. The unlawful aggression must come from the victim. The, the Supreme Court, the 2017 bar exam, last bar, question is, what are the two kinds of unlawful aggression? Based on these two elements, which was stated by the Supreme Court in the case of People versus Fontanilla, the Supreme Court said there are two kinds of unlawful aggression. First, we have the so-called physical or material unlawful aggression, and the other one is the so-called imminent unlawful aggression. There is physical or material unlawful aggression when the attack is done with the use of physical force or by means of a weapon. And the other one is imminent unlawful aggression when the attack is impending or at the point of happening. These are the two kinds of unlawful aggression. The second element of self-defense is reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel the unlawful aggression. The means used by the accused, the person defending himself, must be reasonable, rational, in order to prevent, to counter, the said unlawful aggression coming from the victim. In order to determine whether the means used by the accused is reasonable or rational to prevent the unlawful aggression, you have to consider the following factors. First, you take into consideration the nature and kind of the weapons used by the aggressor versus that of the person defending himself. Second, you take into consideration the height, the weight, the size, the personal circumstances of the aggressor versus that of the, per of the person defending himself. And lastly, you take into consideration the nature and occasion of the assault, the place and occasion of the assault. These three circumstances, these three factors, would determine if the means used by the accused or the person defending himself is rational or reasonable in order to prevent the unlawful aggression. The third element, lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself. There must be no provocation coming from the accused. No sufficient provocation coming from the accused. If it was the accused himself who sufficiently gave the said provocation, then there is no self-defense. The reason behind self-defense is stand ground when in the right. Stand ground when in the right, it means that when the accused is where he should be, the law does not require him to retreat when he saw his assailant fast approaching him. Otherwise, he runs the risk of being stabbed at the back. Stand ground when in the right. When you say self-defense, an act of self-defense is a deliberate and positive overt act done by the accused, done by the offender, based on the impulse of self-preservation. The accused has to kill the victim. The accused has to wound the victim in order to preserve his own life. In, it is based on the impulse of self-preservation. Well, X was walking, five men appeared and encircled X. And thereafter, these men all told X, you give us your personal belongings. You give us your wallet, your bag, your cell phone, everything. However, what X did, X ran away. But this man followed X, and thereafter, they began molding X. These five men boxed X, kicked X, repeatedly until X was pinned down on the ground. When X was pinned down on the ground, the head of this man, A, went on top of X and told X, Pinayrapan mo kami. And because of that, thereafter, he pulled out a knife, and thereafter, he was about to stab X, but X was able to grab a stone, a big stone, 
and he hit the head of A twice. A was brought to the hospital the following day. A died. And so X was prosecuted for homicide. <coughs> X invoked self-defense. According to him, he acted in self-defense. Are all the elements of self-defense present? First, unlawful aggression. There was unlawful aggression coming from the victim A. He and his men surrounded X, mold X. Not satisfied, A himself went on top of the body of X and was about to stab X. That placed the life and limb of X in actual and imminent danger. Hence, there was unlawful aggression. Second, reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel the unlawful aggression. Was the use of a stone reasonable? The use of a stone was reasonable. You take into consideration the nature and weapon of the aggressor, A, as a knife. And he was about to stab the accused. The personal circumstances, they were five, he was one, he was pinned down, A was on top of him. The nature, the place and occasion of the assault, based on the problem, there was no showing that there were other people around. Therefore, the use of the stone is reasonable, rational, in order to prevent the unlawful aggression. Lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself, there was no provocation coming from X. He was only on his way home. All the elements are present, therefore, X should be acquitted of the crime charge of homicide because he merely acted in self-defense. But what if while X was on his way home, why? A whole doctor appeared in front of X, wanting to take the bag of X. He pointed a knife at X. X was slowly taking the bag from his shoulder because according to Y, if you will not give me the bag, I will stab you. And so what X did, he was slowly taking the shoulder bag from his shoulder and when he was at the act of giving it, he suddenly tried to grab the said weapon, the said um, knife of the said holdupper. And both of them struggled for the possession of the said knife. In the course thereof, it was X who gained possession of the knife. Now that X was in possession of the knife, he repeatedly stabbed the holdupper. The holdupper died. X is now prosecuted for homicide. X said, he only acted in self-defense. Is there self-defense? Was there unlawful aggression coming from the victim that is the old doctor? The act of the old doctor pointing a knife saying, you give me the bag, that is unlawful aggression. If he would not give the bag, he would be stopped. That constituted unlawful aggression. However, the moment they wrestled, they struggled for the possession of the knife, and X gained possession of the knife, whatever inceptive and local aggression that had been commenced by the old doctor, it has already ceased to exist. And since the inceptive and local aggression commenced by the old doctor had ceased to exist, X, who is now in possession of the knife, has no more right to wound or even kill the victim. Supreme Court said, when he stopped and killed the victim, he became the unlawful aggressor. The act done is retaliation, not an act of self-defense. Therefore, in this case, the said offender shall be held criminally liable as charge. X shall be held criminally liable as charge of the crime of homicide. Self-defense would not lie in his favor. Well, the woman was on her way home passing by this area, which is slightly lighted only. It was about 5 o'clock in the morning. The sun was not yet out, still dark. The man was waylaid by a man. The woman, I mean, was waylaid by a man. The, the said man suddenly boxed the chest of the woman. The woman felt very weak. And thereafter, the man carried the woman behind the tree. And there, the man placed the woman on the ground and undressed the woman forcibly. 
the woman was the man was undressing himself and when the woman saw that the man was undressing himself the man at, the woman at the time was slowly secretly trying to get a small knife from her bag and when the man positioned himself and placed himself on top of the woman the woman stopped the man with a said knife the knife piercing through the heart of the man the man died Prosecuted for homicide, the woman invokes self-defense and claimed she is not liable as charge. Will a self-defense lie in her favor? First element, unlawful aggression coming from the man. There was unlawful aggression coming from the man. The man backs the woman, undresses the woman, places himself on top of the woman. This place the honor and chastity of the woman in actual and imminent danger. Hence, there is a lawful aggression. Second element, reasonable necessity of the means employed. Based on the facts, the man is unarmed. Is it reasonable for the woman to make use of a knife in order to defend her honor? Said, as I said, you take into consideration the factors. First, the nature and kind of the weapon used by the man. The man has no bladed weapon, but the man has his fist that backs the woman and forcibly undress the woman. Second, the personal circumstances, obviously based on the facts, the man is stronger than that of the woman. And lastly, the place and location of the soul. Early morning, no people around. She was boxed placed behind the tree and there in the Based on these circumstances, the use of a knife was reasonable, rational, in order to defend her honor and chastity. Last element, lack of sufficient provocation. Obviously, there was no sufficient provocation coming from the woman. All the elements being present, the woman should be acquitted of the crime charge. Self-defense would lie. In particular, it was an act done in defense of her honor, in defense of her chastity, which is included in self-defense. X was watching the television. When X was watching the television, X heard something in the garage. And, um, and so he stopped, he left out of the house. And there he saw why was trying to get <coughs> the battery of his jeep. And so when X saw that why was trying to get the battery of um, the battery of his jeepney. X pointed a gun, immediately pulled out a gun and pointed a gun at Y. And told Y, do not get the said jeepney. I do not get the battery of the said jeepney. However, instead of um, instead of returning the said battery, X ran away. And I mean Y ran away. X followed Y. And thereafter, he fired a shot at Y. However, Y was not hit. Y returned the fire. Y fired at X. However, X was not hit. And so Y again fired, or X again fired at Y, and thereafter killing Y. And so X was charged with a crime of homicide. X defense, according to him, he acted in self-defense. Is there self-defense? First, was there a lawful aggression? What was the act of the said victim? The victim took the battery of the uh, jeepney of the accused. Thereafter, he ran away with the said battery. And when he was told to stop, he was parted. He returned the fire and fire at the owner of the said jeepney. That constituted a lawful aggression. And then, thereafter, the, since it, it constituted a local aggression, how about the second element? Reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel the unlawful aggression. Was it reasonable for the owner to fire at the said person who took the battery of his jeepney? It was reasonable. It was reasonable because the said man also fired at him and, he, and they had this exchange of gun fires. Last element, lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself. There was no sufficient provocation coming from the owner of the said jeepney. He was merely watching the television. And then he saw this person trying to get the car. 
and this person, instead of surrendering the battery, fired it. And so he too fired at the said person, killing the said person. There was self-defense, in particular, in defense of himself and in defense of the said property, that is the battery of the said car, because it was coupled with an attack on the person, the owner of the said car. While X and Y were having a drinking spree, X and Y had an argument. In the course of the said argument, X tried to stop Y, but Y evaded the blow and Y ran home. So when Y reached home, he was inside the house, but X kept on knocking at the door, telling Y to open the door. So what Y did, Y took a long bolo in their house, opened the door, and upon opening the door, Y hacked X. X died. Y is prosecuted for the crime of homicide. Before the lower court, Y said, it was merely an accident. According to Y, he killed X because upon opening the door, there was X. He accidentally hacked the victim. Therefore, he is exempted from criminal liability. Despite his defense, the court convicted him. On appeal, he changed his defense. On appeal, he said, it was an act of self-defense. According to him, this victim tried, kept on knocking the door, and was about to stab him, and so he hacked the victim to save his life. Supreme Court said, you cannot invoke as defenses both accident and self-defense. They are contradictory defenses. Because in so far as accident is concerned, accident is a lawful act. In, um, in so far as accident is concerned, there was negligence on the part of the said offender, on the part of the said offender. Whereas, in case of self-defense, it was a direct and positive overt act done by the accused in order to preserve his own life. You cannot invoke these two defenses, these two circumstances. Hence, in that case, the said accused was convicted by the Supreme Court. Self-defense did not lie in his the second justifying circumstance, anyone who acts in defense of the personal rights of his spouse, ascendant, descendants, legitimate, natural, adopted brothers or sisters, relatives by affinity in the same degree, or relatives by consanguinity within the fourth civil degree, provided the following elements are present. First, unlawful aggression. Second, reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel the unlawful aggression. And lastly, in case the provocation was given by the person being defended, that the person making a defense had no part to their view. This is otherwise known as defense of a relative. So it is necessary that the relatives being defended must be within the spouse, ascendants, descendants, legitimate natural or adopted brothers or sisters, relatives by affinity in the same degree, relatives by consanguinity within the fourth civil degree. That is, defense of relative. Unlawful aggression had been discussed. Reasonable necessity had been discussed. How about the third element? Third element, in case the provocation was given by the person being defended, that the person making defense had no part therein. This defense, this justifying circumstance of defense of a relative, would lie in favor of the relative. Even if the relative being defended is the one who provoked the victim, for as long as the relative making the defense is not a party to the said provocation, there is still a valid and legitimate defense of a relative. Under the third justifying circumstance, anyone who acts in defense of the personal rights of a stranger, provided the following requisites, the following elements are present. Again, unlawful aggression. Second, reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel the unlawful aggression. And lastly, that the person defending, that the person making the defense is not induced by revenge, resentment, or other evil motive. In case of defense of a stranger, based on the third element, 
for this justifying circumstance to lie in favor of the Jews, it is necessary that in defending the stranger, he was ignited solely by a disinterested interest and a legitimate intent of helping a total stranger. A noble objective of helping a total stranger. He must not be ignited by revenge, resentment, or any other evil motive. Otherwise, this justifying circumstance would not lie in his favor. This was a question in the bar. X and Y are husband and wife. W was the first cousin of X, the wife. One night, Y, was, y the husband, was on his way home. While Y, the husband, was on his way home, he took notice of a commotion at the other side of the street. And there he saw W, the first cousin of his wife, having an argument with two men. When he looked again, he saw that one of the men was about to stab W, the first cousin of his wife. And so what the husband Y did, he hurriedly ran, saw a piece of wood, on the ground, took the piece of wood and hit the head of the person who was about to stab the said uh, W, was about to stab W, the first cousin of the wife. The said person survived, and so the husband was charged with frustrated homicide. The husband invoked defense of a relative. Will defense of a relative lie in his favor? Defense of a relative would not lie in his favor. The relatives being defended must be the spouse, ascendants, descendants, legitimate natural adopted brothers or sisters, or relatives by affinity in the same degree. W, the first cousin of the wife, is a relative by affinity of the husband. And in case of relative by affinity, it must be of the same degree as ascendants, descendants, brothers, and sisters. W is not among these. Therefore, it cannot be defense of a relative. It should be defense of a stranger already, no longer defense of a relative. Hence, his defense of defense of a relative would not lie in his favor. It should be defense of a stranger under paragraph 3 of Article 11. <coughs> Before justifying circumstance, any person who, in order to avoid an evil or injury, does an act which causes damage to another, provided the following elements are present. First, that the evil sought to be avoided actually exists. Second, that the injury could be greater than that done to avoid it. And third, that there be no other practical or less harmful means of preventing it. This is otherwise known as state of necessity. In order to avoid an evil or injury, the said accused has to do a harm, has to do an injury on another. <laughs> in order for state of necessity to lie in favor of the accused and, it's, and the said act of him be justified, it is necessary that the said person must not be the author of the said state of necessity. If the accused himself authored, placed himself in the said state of necessity, he cannot invoke this justifying circumstance in order to free him from both criminal and civil liability. In case of justifying circumstances, there is no criminal liability and as a rule, there is no civil liability. Exception to that is state of necessity under paragraph 4. In case of state of necessity, there is civil liability. And this civil liability shall be imposed by the court against all persons who have been benefited by the said state of necessity. And under Article 101 of the RPC, it is provided that when there are many persons who have been benefited by this state of necessity, the court shall divide the civil liability proportionately among all these persons who have been benefited by the said state of necessity. X was, um, it was um, raining hard. X was driving his car. It was past 3 o'clock in the morning. He was driving his car carefully. 
within LTO rules and um, regulation. It was raining, almost dark. Suddenly, while he was driving the car, he saw in front of him a big truck. It was no early warning device. It was no warning that there was this big truck. No lights whatsoever. And it seems that the truck has some damage and there was a person who was trying to repair the said truck. If X would go on, his car would hit the truck. If he would turn to the left, he would be hitting an island. If he would turn to the right, he would be hitting this certain small shanty wherein perhaps a family was fast asleep. And so what he did, he turned to the right. And indeed, the said shanty was damaged and the three persons sleeping inside all sustained serious physical injuries. So X was charged with reckless imprudence resulting in multiple serious physical injuries. The defense of, him, the defense of X, he acted in a state of necessity. Hence, according to him, he is not criminally liable. Will his defense lie in his favor? First element, that the evil sought to be avoided actually exists. The evil that he sought to avoid, the collision between his car and the big truck. If he would go on, this collision could result to his death. Second, that the injury feared be greater than that done to avoid it. Fear of losing his life is greater than anything, even the death or the physical injury sustained by the victims. And lastly, there is no practical or other, or other less harmful means of preventing it. If he would go on, there would be collision. If he would turn to the left, he would be hit in an island. The car would be damaged and he too may be injured or he would die. And so, the only option to turn to the right and hit these people. Therefore, his state of necessity is present. His act is justified. He cannot be criminally liable, but he is civilly liable for the injury sustained by this victim. And civil liability shall be imposed on him alone because there are no other persons benefited except on except himself. Hence, although not criminally liable, he shall be civilly liable under the so-called state of necessity. But what if it is the accused who authored the state of necessity? So let us say that this um, there was this taxi. The taxi was uh, flagged down by a family of five. The family boarded. The taxi was in Makati, and the family said that they're going to Pasig. And um, so the taxi driver knew there was heavy traffic along Edsa. And so from Makati, he tried to pass by Mandaluyong San Juan in order to go to Pasig. He knew of this easy road and so what he did was when he went to this place to this to this uh to this shortcut he immediately saw a big signboard even with lights it states do not enter the tour do not enter he did not mind it he usually passed by the shortcut and nothing happened to him and so he went inside in a high speed until he saw himself in a state of necessity. There was a deep, very deep excavation. If he would go on, the said taxi would fall on the said deep excavation. If, if he would turn to the left, there is a big blank hole. Turning to the right, he would be hitting several persons hitting on a store. He turned to the right and hit these persons. And they all suffered less serious physical injury. And so he was charged with reckless imprudence resulting in multiple less serious physical injuries. His defense, his act was justified, he acted in a state of necessity. Can he invoke the said defense? He cannot invoke the said defense because he is the one who placed himself in the said state of necessity. He is the one who authored the said state of necessity. Had he obeyed the signboard, the tour did not enter he would not be placed in that situation. Therefore, for that, he cannot invoke state of necessity and he shall be held criminally liable as charged for reckless imprudence resulting in multiple less serious physical injuries. Then we have the 
Fifth, justifying circumstance, any person who acts in the performance of his duty or in the local exercise of his right or office. The elements of this justifying circumstance are, first, it is necessary that the offender acted in the performance of his duty or in the local exercise of his right or office. And second, the resulting injury is the unavoidable consequence, the necessary consequence of the due performance of his duty. So it is necessary that whatever be the felony that resulted, it must be the unavoidable, the necessary consequence of the said accused due performance of his duty. Under the last justified circumstance, under Article 11, any person who acts in obedience to an order issued by his superior for some lawful purpose. The elements are first, that an order has been issued by his superior. Second, that this order is for some lawful purpose. And lastly, that the means used by the subordinate to carry out the order must also be lawful. These are the elements of obedience to a lawful order. In this justified circumstance, it is necessary that the order given by the superior must not be the only one lawful. The means used by the subordinate to carry out the said lawful order must also be lawful. Even if the order was, the order of the superior was lawful, but the means used was unlawful, this justified circumstance would not lie in favor of the said accused. X was a prisoner convicted by final judgment. During a riot, a commotion inside the believing, X took it as the opportunity for him to escape. He has a successful escape, but his escape was immediately detected by the prison authorities. The prison authorities followed him and called police assistance. The prison authorities and the police followed X and they saw X entered a house forcibly and then X took a boy. And then he took a knife and he placed a said knife at the throat of the boy, warning the police, warning the prison authorities if you come any nearer, I will hack this boy, I will stop this boy. And so the police officers just stayed foot, could not do anything, the boy might be hurt. The boy was crying, and, the, and because of the cries of the boy, the said prisoner who escaped got so mad, irritated with the cries, he was about to stop the boy. But the police officer, police officer A, Fired a shot, hitting the head of the prisoner, the prisoner died. When the said police officer was charged with a crime of murder, with a crime I mean of homicide, he invoked the defense that, according to him, he was merely acting in the performance of his duty. He was only acting in the fulfillment of a right or office. Therefore, according to him, his act is justified. Are all the elements of the fifth justifying circumstance present? First element, that the offender acted in the due performance of his duty. The police officer was there in order to arrest him. He was an escapee from the penal institution. Therefore, he was in the performance of his duty. The second element, the resulting injury, the resulting felony is the unavoidable, the necessary consequence of the due performance of his duty. Is firing at the said prisoner, the unavoidable consequence of the performance of his duty. His duty was to bring him back to prison. It is also the duty of the said police officer to save the life of the boy held hostage by this prisoner. And when the said prisoner was about to stop the boy, that is when he fired at the said prisoner. Therefore, the killing of the said prisoner was a necessary means, unavoidable consequence in order to save the life of the boy, which is an exercise of his duty to save the life of a boy, to save the life of the people. Therefore, the police officer should be acquitted of the crime charge is as justified based on the fifth justifying circumstance. The husband and the wife 
had been living together for 10 years. 